Thank you, Debbie, for my introduction. And thank you to all of you for coming out and listening to me this evening. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Andrew Gerstel. I'm the director of the Museum of Anthropology at Wake Forest University. Uh, I'm also a professor of anthropology in the department there, uh, so I do some teaching as well. Uh, and as Debbie mentioned, my background is in uh, not only anthropology, but also art. So I do feel kind of equally comfortable, I guess, in both museum spaces. But tonight, I am here to strictly talk to you all in my role as the anthropologist, uh, interpreting uh, some of the time capsule artifacts as an anthropologist would. Well, as I, as I do, I suppose. So to start that, I'd like to maybe briefly talk about what anthropology actually is, what it is that anthropologists do, or what it is they study. So anthropology really I guess the most simple definition is that it's the study of people, uh, specifically uh, human culture, what we do, what we think, how humans organize themselves, what they create, what they build, and most importantly, why they do all those things. Anth anthropology is really, in a sense, uh, similar to maybe the domain of philosophy in the humanities, uh, but rather than thinking through ideas, using a system of logic or rational thought to explore why humans do what they do. Anthropology instead looks at data as a social scientist, trying to infer or deduce patterns from behavior, from large-scale societal patterns, and then make sense of that, uh, try to figure out the why to why it is people go to talks at art museums on Tuesday nights, for example, right? What are the underlying motivations for these kinds of human behaviors. So human, of, human behavior, of course, can be ephemeral. It can be action-oriented, like sitting and listening, uh, right? That is a behavior. But it also often has a physical material product. It has objects associated with it. And anthropologists are called upon to interpret what objects mean. Uh, there's actually a lot of bleeding between art museums and anthropology museums. Oftentimes it feels like anthropology museums are the art museums for non-Western cultures. Uh, we'll often see great works of art, but from maybe a different cultural background than traditional Euro-American painting and sculpture. We might see uh, regalia or costuming, we might see beadwork, we might see uh, wooden sculptures. Uh, oftentimes, many of the objects in anthropology museums are religious or ritually oriented, but that doesn't reduce the fact that they were created by humans with aesthetic choices and beliefs guiding the creation of those objects. So, I think maybe that could be why I was invited here to talk about these objects, because anthropologists do really interpret material like this. They interpret things and try to get at the underlying philosophy or belief or symbolism or behaviors or practices, these human elements that create the forms, right, that are left in these time capsule objects. Before I get to the objects themselves, because I've been doing a lot of research on these two objects to try to really get the ins and outs of them, what it is that they mean to the artists that created them, to the visitors that see them, to society generally, I want to talk about how anthropologists kind of come to these conclusions, the underlying assumptions that anthropologists make. And to do that, I'm going to share a couple of stories from my personal life. Uh, so I just started here at, at Wake Forest in Winston-Salem uh, only in August. So I'm a fairly recent transplant. Before that, I was at the University of Michigan. Uh, and to get from Michigan to North Carolina, my family and I, uh, some of whom are here today, uh, we drove the entire way, right? We loaded up all our things into the car and we hit the road on a road trip from Ann Arbor, Michigan to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Along the way, of course, we were driving along the freeway. We had to stop at toll booths and an interesting thing happened at a high elevation toll booth somewhere in the Appalachian Mountains in uh, West Virginia. So we had just changed out our license plate and I hadn't quite remembered what it is and we were driving along and we stopped at the toll booth and I was shocked. I'm not 
paid such high tolls on the East Coast before coming from the Midwest, I was pretty shocked that I had to pay over $10 at one toll booth. Uh, and I was also shocked that they demanded cash that I couldn't pay any other way. So of course I didn't have enough cash. And I told the wonderful toll booth taker, uh, the toll booth attendant, that I didn't have the money, what should I do? And she handed me a form to fill out. On it, it needed my license plate number. I didn't really know what it was. So I went to open the door, and of course I was wedged into this narrow toll booth place and the door didn't quite open. Uh, luckily we drive a hatchback, so I kind of maneuvered my way from the driver's seat out the trunk and got out and closed the door, wrote down the license plate number, maneuvered my way back in, and filled out the rest of the form. I was kind of stressed out at this point. Uh, we had our four-year-old in the car, right? I was, you know, there's a long line of cars behind us. The toll booth attendant was not the most sympathetic face uh, in the world to all of this. And as I was leaning out to hand her back the form, the sun kind of got in my eyes and I remember squinting. At this point, the attendant starts yelling at me. She says, how dare you wink at me, sir, with your wife in the car? And my head starts spinning. I have no idea what she's talking about. Uh, and then she continues on, though. She says, this is so insulting. She starts yelling at me that you know, we better keep moving and get out of here before something happens. Uh, and I'm trying to make sense of what's going on at the moment. And as we're driving away, I realized that she had interpreted my facial gesture as a wink, right? Which could be somewhat innocuous if you're blinded by the sun and just trying to see what you're doing. But of course, a wink has many different meanings that can be attached to it. And she chose to attach one very specific meaning, a kind of lascivious wink, this kind of leering gesture, right? Of maybe a lewd gesture that, and certainly winks have that meaning in a certain context. <laughs> and now there's a very famous anthropologist by the name of Clifford Geertz. And Geertz actually, as I was driving away, I recalled this, reading this passage in one of his books, where he actually writes about the wink. He, the wink is actually this classic anthropological example about how do you interpret meaning from human behavior. Because the wink can be this kind of lewd gesture, but a wink can also have a conspiratorial quality, right? If you're sharing a knowing secret between friends, uh, it can also maybe let someone in on a joke, right? Knowing, let them know that something amiss is happening, but it's mostly harmless. Uh, a wink could also be something's caught in your eye. A wink could be an involuntary twitch that's signaling someone with a neurological disorder. A wink has many different meanings that can be attached to it, and it's important to know what the context is that's happening. Apparently, the context of a wink at an Appalachian toll booth is always lewd and lascivious, though. That's crystal clear at this point. But Geertz's, Geertz's meaning behind discussing the different interpretations of a wink is that in a vacuum, right, if we have just things on a plain background with no other meaning or clues around them, it becomes very difficult to infer the meaning of any one symbolic gesture or one visual symbol. The meaning behind the wink has to, has to be deduced within a context. And the actors involved, who's winking, who's receiving the wink, the time of day, the, so, the social circumstance that's happening around the wink, all of those contribute to the meaning. Now, of course, that wink example can be extended to material objects, right? We have here a gold ring. We have here a wooden block cut at a certain angles. Now some of you might have meanings that you attach to those objects, right? I think when we actually look at the response board uh, about people who have visited the gallery, discussed their ideas about these objects, I don't think it would be unsurprising to you that many people associated that ring with a wedding ring, with a wedding band, that that band is associated with a certain special relationship between ostensibly two people, that there are certain emotions or ideas or attitudes invested in what that symbol means. But Geertz would caution us to say that we don't know much about it. It's not, I mean, it's not, it's clearly not a wedding ring anymore at least. It's a museum object. 
It's an art object that maybe looks like a wedding ring, is evocative of that. And there's another anthropologist. This is, I'm sorry to tell, let you all in. You're actually hearing a miniature lecture about the history of anthropology. There's another anthropologist named Alfred Gell. And Gell wrote specifically about objects, and specifically about art objects. Maybe some of you have read him in the arts community. He wrote a fascinating book called Art and Agency. And in that, he makes the claim that art objects are not unlike humans, in that they act upon other humans, that artwork, objects, have a certain ability to manipulate people. And I think since we're all here at an art gallery, I think this would be the most sympathetic crowd to agree that artwork can affect you, that artwork does maybe trigger a thought or a feeling or an emotion or a state of being within you, and that's not unlike maybe interacting with other humans, that humans also have that ability, but they're not the exclusive owners of this, that objects can do it too. And so when we might see this gold band, it might act on us, right? Tell us about the idea of a marriage or a wedding or a commitment between people or a symbol of wealth and value if you pick up on the gold aspects of it. That all of these are meanings that the object is acting on you, right? You see the object and in a stimulus response, right, the object acting as the stimulus, the response is to trigger these associations or these meanings. Now, a third anthropologist, and this is the last anthropologist I'll name drop tonight, is a man named Igor Kapitov. Clearly the best name of the three tonight. And Igor Kapitov picked up on Gell's idea but said, you know, objects don't always act predictably, and they certainly don't act the same at every point in time. Further picking up on the human analogy, Kapitov said that objects actually have lifespans, that they have biographies that their meaning changes through time as, as Geertz mentioned, the social context around them changes through times. That may have been a wedding band. It might have been, it might have served in a marriage ceremony as a wedding band, but at the moment, that's not what it is. There's no finger on it, thankfully. Uh, <laughs> be a little grisly if there was, uh, but rather it's, a, it's an isolated object underneath uh, underneath a, a, a bell jar in a museum, right? It's not any of the social context that we would expect a wedding band to operate in. So it's clearly not that. If it was a wedding band, its meaning has changed, right? A new part of its biography is being written right now. You might think of, you know, the, create, the mining of the gold ore, right, as its infancy and the smelting, uh, the refinement of that metal as its youth. And then maybe its first career was as a wedding band. But right now it's past that. Maybe a second career it was pawned and sold as a, as a wealth, as an object of monetary value. And now it's, on its, it's in retirement at the museum. Uh, it's, it's come here to rest for a little while. Uh, and at each of these stages, Kapitov tells us that the meaning that we invest in it changes, right? So all three of these anthropologists, Gertz, Gell, and Kapitov, they all work in tandem with one another, just basically to remind us that we have to pay attention to the context of the object if we want to know anything about its meaning. Now, that's great, and it seems a little solipsistic, right? We can never know anything. Oh no, what are we to do if we are entirely dependent on the present context to infer meaning? But that's not necessarily true. Now, as Debbie mentioned, I am the director of a museum also, and I am invested in objects and their meaning and telling the stories behind them. And so I spend a lot of time trying to preserve the meaning, to try to preserve the context, the social context behind the anthropological artifacts that I have on display at my museum. And there's a lot of assistance in that, right? We have whole institutions, industries to remind us of the meaning behind objects. It wasn't simply assuming that this was a wedding band. It's not simply that two people thought of this idea that we're going to use a gold ring to symbolize our union. Brilliant! No, they're operating in a historical script that goes back hundreds of years that this 
precious metal called gold, right, with a certain atomic weight, should be formed into a loop, right, thicker bands for men, thinner bands for women typically, or rounded for women, and that these are then given to one another, right? This is a cultural script. And it's not just some kind of archaic notion of tradition that moves us and propels this, 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 tra uh, this trapping along, right? There are industries. There's a multi-billion dollar jewelry industry that promotes the interests of this idea. There are advertisements every day that continue to condition people to believe that this object has this certain meaning associated with it. So there, it's not that just that objects grow old and their meaning is lost, but rather they're continually reinforced by other people. Maybe if we take Gell at his word by other objects too, that objects work in tandem with one another to continually reinforce their meaning. So as an anthropologist and a museum professional, I'm always maybe very aware, very hyper aware about trying to reproduce the social context of objects so that the visitors to my museum or the people who read my anthropological texts will be able to faithfully or accurately understand the meaning behind these objects, right? And I think that might differ, differ a little bit from art museums in that art museums certainly present objects in a context and they want their visitors to take meaning from the objects, but I think maybe art museums are a little bit more okay about visitors having their own meaning, right? They're more aware, well not more aware, but maybe more understanding of visitors bringing themselves to the experience, whereas anthropology museums, there's one correct meaning and we want you to get it. No, there are many m meanings, of course, because there are many different human agents in a culture, each with a valid interpretation of these objects, but maybe we just want to get across that social context a little bit more. So let me talk about these two objects specifically then, right? I've already talked about the gold ring, so that seems like a natural place to start. What do you guys think? So when you saw this gold ring, maybe I can ask the audience, did anyone think of a certain meaning or immediately recognize what that object was? Maybe as a show of hands, did anyone think like a wedding band? Okay, so probably the majority of people here, yeah, I think correctly thought that this was a wedding band. And you know, there's a couple clues, right? If it was just a gold loop, could be tough to infer, right? I mean, it certainly could be a wedding band, but maybe it was an art object specifically created by the artist to never be a, wedding, a real wedding band, but to actually serve as this time capsule object. I'm so glad you included this photo, though, because it shows something right here that you will not be able to read, but you might be able to see that there's a small amount of a, ooh, that actually does something on the screen when I touch it. Uh, <laughs> you might actually see that there is, can I loop this? Oh, perfect. You might actually see in that little box I created that there's some fine etching on the inside of the band. And it's actually a brand name. It's a trademark. The mark of the band says Ed Force. Ed Force. Okay, so I go home and I type into Google Ed Force. Uh, and I find that Ed Force is a now defunct, or at least it was purchased by another jewelry company, uh, kind of a discount lower end maker of predominantly men's jewelry, which is interesting because this is a, more a style that would be associated, I guess, typically or traditionally within a Euro-American uh, heteronormative religious practice as being a, a more feminine ring. But Ed Force does actually create both. It just specializes in men's ring. Now, the interesting thing is that it's a very low budget discount option when you're buying a wedding ring. Um, it's also a brand that no longer really exists, so they didn't do very well, which makes me wonder, you know, does that change the meaning at all? Because I wonder if you were to give a wedding band in a wedding ceremony, if it changes the meaning, if it's the least expensive option possible. Does anyone feel like when it comes to exchanging jewelry within a romantic relationship, that value has any significance? Like the monetary value of the item has a significance? I mean, I think a lot of people would say no, you know, it's, it's the thought that counts, but I think that there is a cultural script actually that does say that the value of the jewelry actually is an indication, right? Maybe not a one-to-one -one gauge about how much you love that person, uh, but I think that there is an idea that if you spend more, right, if you're sacrificing more of your resources, if you're spending that money on, you know, not on something else for your personally or frivolously, but for a gesture to this person, that it maybe does have more of a meaningful impact.
So of course that means the question I'm getting at, and maybe we're all too polite to say, is this person a cheapskate? <laughs> right? Aha, thank you so much for mentioning that. Uh, because we might think that, you know, was this person spending the appropriate amount, whatever that might be, but maybe this is from an individual from a impoverished circumstance and that r proportionally or relatively to their resources, this is actually a very elaborate grand gesture that it might even have more meaning than if you know, a billionaire buys his bride, his new bride, you know, a, 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 a several thousand dollar diamond tiara, right? I don't know. I'm, I'm terrible at gauging jewelry prices, let's say. Sorry, Shay. Uh, you can ask my wife. Um, Let me know where you can find one. What's that? Let me know when you can find, where you can find one. Yeah, I'll let you know. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's the man-made diamonds, not the ones that are mined, actually. Uh, the ones made under high pressure from carbon. Uh, so the point, again, is that while we think we might know kind of the general cultural meaning, right? We can kind of infer a general cultural meaning as this connotations with weddings or romanticism, right? Personal relationships at the very least. It's very hard to drill down from there to the specific circumstance without that larger context, right? About is this kind of, is this in a sense, you know, a, a poor gift, right? Is this not a very good gesture? Is this something that maybe the recipient researched found out how inexpensive it was, was kind of maybe, you know, was um, explicitly upset about it, or maybe it was something that they stewed over and kind of ate them up on the inside, right? Uh, maybe it was the beginning of a downfall of a relationship. Or was it a different social context in which this was an incredibly elaborate gesture, that this was a gesture that cemented a relationship that, you know, continued on in perpetuity? It's hard to know the more specific meanings, even when we think we have a good idea of the object itself. So what about this other object? I chose, I actually chose, uh, Debbie asked me, why did you choose those two objects? Out of all the possible objects I could have selected from, especially because I believe I had first choice. Um, and I probably chose the worst too, right? <laughs> Not what she said, but let's look at the meaning, right, of this social context. Uh, all right. But, <laughs> uh, but this other object, right, I chose the ring because it is so apparent that the small ring here, I'm, I'll be moving back, the small ring here has a very maybe obvious meaning, a cultural attachment we can place on it, but this wood block seems very, I don't know, esoteric, abstract. How do we infer the meaning from that? Does anyone have an idea about what it means? Hmm. I mean, it's very difficult to think of this as a symbolically laden object. It has a form, certainly, and maybe that form is significant, right? And this is where the anthropologist's tool of description, I think, really becomes important. It's a, it's a skill set we share with artists and art historians and art professionals in being able to describe the minutia of what we're seeing, the senses of that object to kind of infer more meaning than might be apparent at the beginning. So when I look at this object, I immediately recognize that this is mass manufactured lumber, right? That this, the grain of the wood, uh, the grain of the wood, the uh, smoothness of the edges of it, let's say, that these are indicative of, to me of, you know, a two by four essentially of of lumber. Yet at the same time there are surfaces on it that are rough, more rough. Oh, I love that. I keep forgetting it's going to happen though. Uh, there's also, oh cool, there's also right there a mark where it's been sawn. There's a couple other marks where it's been sawn right here for example, um, as well as I think there's another one right there. Places where a, a blade, a saw blade has cut into the wood and it makes me think that Maybe we're not seeing the object itself, we're seeing the detritus. We're seeing the leftovers of the creation of something else. We're seeing cast off leavings, right, garbage, however you want to frame it. We're seeing the, 
the, the void that the object has been cut from, right? And I wonder if that changes our meaning because it's still an object, it's still an artifact, it's still been worked by human hands, but it hasn't been invested with a coherent meaning. Instead, though, what we have is a kind of dissonance within the object itself. There's still meaning there. Garbage is incredibly meaningful. The things that people choose not to take with them, right? The things people choose to not curate or preserve are perhaps even more telling than what we decide to bring with us, to take with us, and to maintain. So is the meaning, the void around it, right, the actual useful object that was cut from this wood? Or is this object special in and of itself? Now, of course, if we look at Geertz's social context, you, the object is treated much better than other objects. It's under glass in a museum. Uh, that it limits us to a very, very small subset of all objects in existence currently. Um, and typically, when we think of museums under, or objects under glass in a museum, do we think of this as a high status object or a low status object? We think of it as high status. We give it special permissions or special attributes we wouldn't with a normal sawn piece of a two by four. If that was sitting on the floor of a wood shop, you could kick it, you could step on it, you could pick it up, you could give it to your four year old to practice hammering and nails, right? You could do all kinds of things with that. When I bring my four year old here, I don't give him a hammer and nails and say, hey, go, go demolish all the artwork in that exhibit, right? Because we're living in a social context where objects in museums have certain rules, right? They have, in a Gellian sense, they impose on us certain restrictions on what we do to it, right? It tells us how we are supposed to interact with it. And drawing from Kapitoff and thinking that this object has had multiple lives, right? We can see where it maybe started off as this incredibly low status object, this leaving, this trash, and over time is Become, become elevated, right, to this museum object. It's kind of, I liked that object because it represents this reverse trajectory. We normally think about high status objects falling into disrepair and becoming trash, not trash becoming elevated to an object warranted inclusion in a major art show, right? And then even a subset of those objects that are then highlighted to have professionals from the area come and speak about them, right? So. It's a very interesting object, I think, from that sense. I also like to think about it in the sense of snake oil. Right? We're all familiar maybe with the, the euphemism of snake oil, an object that doesn't live up to what it says it's, it, people say about it it's going to do. Right? An object that doesn't really do much of anything, but people believe it has power. In a Gellian sense, people believe it has this agency, even if it really doesn't. And I like this object because it does have these cut lines at very uh, sharp angles, right? It's very well machined. It maybe could trick you since it's in a museum context where you feel that it should have meaning if it's under glass, right? Uh, the classic uh, modern art that I, debate that I have with my freshman students uh, when they insist that, you know, they, that modern art has no symbolic meaning. And I try to argue with them, well, uh, you know, maybe if you thought about the context, maybe if you thought about the form, maybe if you thought about the human actions that took it into being, there might be some value or meaning behind it. And I think that this is the case here where if I hadn't primed us all to regard this as garbage, and I admit that I just did that by using the word garbage about a dozen times, um, if I hadn't done that, we might have gone up to that and we could have had a completely different conversation where I talk about how the object is reflective of the Adrinka symbolic vocabulary of the Asante people of Ghana, West Africa, right? And about how that object emulates the form for a specific symbol, meaning long life and longevity, right? Which it does. It does actually resemble that form of the Adrinka. Uh, the Adrinka is a system of a couple dozen symbols which are used in textiles and pottery in the Asante people of West Africa, and it's incredibly symbolically meaningful. And this one, if you flipped it 180 degrees, somewhat resembles one of those symbols. I doubt that's what the intent of the artist is. Maybe it's a meaningless coincidence, right? Maybe it's this kind of snake oil in the sense that 
it's an object that's acting on me at least, as knowledgeable within this domain of Adrinka symbols, that it's acting on me, but it's not really what it is, right? That's not the history of the object, that's not what its biography maybe would lead us to believe, yet it still acts in that capacity. It still has this property. People still believe it does something, even if it's not, maybe from an objective sense, if we can claim that, doing that. So, the short answer to how would an anthropologist interpret these objects is that the anthropologist would say, kind of do the classic thing that academics do where they throw up their hands and say, ah, I don't have enough information to give you a definitive answer, right? Give me a, a half a million dollar research grant, 10 more years and I'll get back to you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I'm maybe more pragmatic than the average anthropologist since I am responsible for interpreting objects for my visitors on a daily basis. And so I will offer interpretations, right? I'll interpret the fact that if we look at this in a cultural normative view, the gold ring is an emblem of personal relationships, right? That it's a token in a sense. It's a way of showing value through exchange, through gifting, which is something very human, very relatable, right? I would also maybe try to offer the two opinions I already did that based on what we know about this specific object, about its um, economic status or its quality from a monetary point of view, that it might either represent a, you know, a modest gift in a modest socioeconomic circumstance, it might represent an elaborate gift in a poor socioeconomic status, or it might represent a poor gift in a high socioeconomic status. It might also have none of those meanings and instead have sentimental value. Since the company only existed from the early 2000s to uh, a couple of years ago, I doubt it was really had this kind of hair, heirloom or uh, you know, m m uh, uh, sentimental value, but it certainly could have. You know, it could have been involved in a, an incredibly elaborate story where it changed hands multiple times and there was backstabbing and intrigue involved and it flew around the world with people. We just don't know. I need that grant money before I can really tell you the answer to that. And then the other object, again, from a cultural perspective, a writ large cultural perspective, I would say that it's a piece of leavings from a larger sculpture work or a larger artistic work, knowing its museum context. I would also say, though, that in and of itself it has value in showing us the tools the artist used, right? The use of power saws in creating this object, right? The kind of use of industrial machines in the pursuit of artistic vision. I think that has a lot of value and meaning attached to it. I also think it's meaningful that it is this remnant that still has a very striking form. It still, despite being a remnant, at least to my own eye, has its own sense, I just touched my mic, has its own artistic merit to it in a sense. So, again, if I were forced to interpret these objects for you without knowing their social context, I feel like I could get to some meaning at the end by observing the object, by thinking about its history, right, its biography, by thinking about how the object might act on its viewers, how it might act in its social context, whatever that social context might have been. All right, thank you. Later, this thing is excavated, 
the full complete record. Very, materially very important, right? And so there's this expectation that everything that's on that record will speak for us to the future, right? It will speak beyond our corporeal ephemeral bodies, it will speak beyond our our civilization. And hopefully, you know, this machine, this technology even has the means for its playback by people who are intelligent like the ones that we don't have, right? So there's this kind of projection of our culture into that space. Now, that's a definitive time. This is a very unusual time capsule. This is a time capsule, as you so rightly pointed out, where we invited artists to contribute artifacts. No rules, you pick the A lot of these artifacts, as if you stick around and do a little walk record, actually relate to the artworks that are in the show. But beyond that, they also have broader or more diffused, more open cultural meanings that we might Imagine, right? So, part of the reason we're sitting here is to also open up an invitation for you guys to say, yes, in this particular context of contemporary art, we can actually co create the meaning of what these objects might mean now, might not mean now, but then also, let's even open this up further. What could it mean in the future? So, I want to now back up for a second and I want to ask you. As an anthropologist, um, how do you use the past to understand the culture, or let's say, in the present tense? How, how does that relationship to time actually work? Because sometimes, as you're saying, you get a shard of pottery, you get a scrap of fabric, you really don't have the whole story behind this object. How does that work? Well, considering the history of pottery, the historic objects, that's the time capsule the objects, will eventually become, right? Mm -hmm. In another time place, at least another time. And so understanding this history is very, very important. Um, I mean, there's, I'd like to use the uh, analogy of entropy, that no matter what, as objects get further away from their social context, they inherently lose meaning. And it's one of the kind of tragedies and joys of the museum director is constantly trying to update and think of new ways to talk about the original context, to try to communicate the original context as our own context starts further and further away from what that historic moment is. Uh, and the Gold Ring is another great example of that. Uh, many of your visitors on the response forums you know, key into the idea of the Gold Ring symbolizing marriage. But, you know, a Gold Ring uh, symbolized many types of relationships apart from marriage. It certainly uh, symbolized many different relationships. Uh, typically, actually, uh, symbolized political relationships well before it symbolized even kind of romantic interpersonal relationship. And so, from that sense, right, the gold ring both predates its use in marriage, and marriage also predates the use of gold rings. So, both of those institutions, the idea of gifted gold rings and the idea of the uh, same thing a spouse or more than one spouse, uh, both of those ideas were independent and only have recently come together. Clearly, there's no reason that they might drift apart. And certainly, I'm married and don't wear rings, and I don't think that's atypical of many people today. And um, I think that you know the meaning of these objects is certainly uncoupled and taken apart. And, yeah, and so it'll be a challenge, you know, a hundred years in the future, five hundred years in the future. It won't be self-evident that a gold ring symbolizes marriage. It might be a gold ring symbolizes, you know, which uh, which uh, alien overlord you would report to or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever the future holds for us. Um, it could be a completely different thing. Uh, and I think that's part of the challenge of really thinking about what what documents and evidence do we need to find? Um, certainly, an anthropologist can try to move backward in time, look at how institutions have changed, and think about how social perceptions have changed, and therefore infer what the historical meaning of the object would be, and we certainly do that. Uh, and I know that an archaeologist can do 
uh, here in a future talk, and uh, they'll be an excellent person to discuss that idea further about how we actually can go back by that point, era by era, backwards in time, and kind of pivot our meaning according to whatever evidence we have. So, evidence is really important. Yes. So, is the concept of using time capsule related to the whole study of anthropology and archaeology, and when did they start? Decided to create time capsules to record a snapshot of time. Because you know, there was a time when those were rampant activities with the grading pyramids and everyone was using antiquities. I mean, do those go together? I mean, when did they start to create time capsules? That's a really good question. I, I think there are several, I'm sure there are many answers to that question, and they're all probably right. You know, from what I've read, um, the time capsule, at least in the popular culture, really became popularized in the last hundred years, and probably around, uh, also around the Cold War, um, this idea of <laughs> burying, sort of burying the time capsule, um, of having you know, discrete cultures represent their technology in, in a very progressive form of the way. Um, but the beauty of the idea of the time capsule is that while culturally specific, I think you can think of our purpose as time capsules. You can think of many different things as time capsules. In this exhibition, um, some of the artifacts that are incorporated in the artworks, for example, are seeds. I think of a seed as a time capsule because, in my interpretation, a seed carries definitive genetic information and it is in the form of unrealized potential until it is buried and it grows into something else. So, how could, maybe that's also a time so there's a specific time capsule question that you're asking, but I will also invite you to think very broadly about, um, and I think that's what this exhibition is trying to do, is to expand our working definition of um, artifact and art, what would be a time capsule, what is contemporary, what is not contemporary. Did you want to respond to that as well? Yeah. That, that's a great question. Oh, it is a good question, and I think to really, maybe, I'm sure there is kind of a chronological answer that you know, the first time capsule was buried in 1834 and totally didn't exist, something like that. But I think if you look at it from a, uh, you know, a, a, what an anthropologist might ask, which is why do people start burying time capsules as opposed to strictly when, I think that the answer would have to come from the fact that while Wanting to be remembered seems like, from an archaeological and anthropological point of view, extends to our very deepest human history, right? That the idea of memorialization of individuals and individuals recognizing that they will die, and that yet at the same time that their presence, what they did in life, will be carried on by their descendants or by the people later, that they're presence in life will not, will not necessarily die with them, that memorialization is kind of a natural outgrowth of that. That seems to have existed for at least tens of thousands of years. Exactly right. I mean, the pyramid is a perfect example. But a time capsule is different. You know, a time capsule is not about the individual. A time capsule is about the society or the culture of one collective group. And for that to be relevant, for that thought to even occur, there has to be an idea that there, you know, there's a, first of all, there has to be the idea that there's a collective we, right? There has to be the idea that there is a society to represent in the time capsule, or in this case, the artists to represent in the time capsule. There also has to be an idea that it, there is a different culture out there somewhere that will be encountering this, right? Because if the same people dig it up, it's not really any, it's, there's no relevance to that, right? If you bury a time capsule and then dig it up the next day, <laughs> that's great, right? You know, that, that, has, that has very little meaning in that act. Uh, so even if you, you know, even if you said, you know, I don't want to, you know, show a parent this, you can bury a flag and an apple pie right in the ground, and then, you know, a couple weeks later, an American also digs it up, they find a flag and a rock out the pie, and it's not that going to be that meaningful. They don't work very readily be able to understand what they have to mean, etc. So there has to be not only a we, but there has to be a them. 
right? The people who are bearing it as distinct from the people who are uncovering it. And I think the third critical component is there has to be a sense that we will no longer be here. And I think that's very different than saying, I will no longer be here. I think it's very easy to say, to recognize one's mortality and to say, I will no longer be here, right? I think that people know that. But I think, I do not think it's a typical experience to have a sense of impending apocalypse, to have the sense that the we will no longer be here. I think it's actually in the scope of human society much more normal to assume that we will always be here, that we will, you know, society is not going to go anywhere, right? That people will always be here, and they'll always be like us, even if time changes that relationship a little bit. So I think those are the kind of the three critical components that we separated, and I would wonder if, even if it's distinct from our own lineage of time caps from like the past hundred years, I would imagine that if you would have those same three ingredients, a sense of we, a sense of them, and a sense of we coming to an end, that you would find practices that resemble time capsules all throughout the world, all throughout history. Some of the examples that I've had in my research, we recently discovered Paul Revere was planted a time capsule. You know, think about the historical context that was happening then. There was a lot of them proliferating around the war era, the post World War II era, and I think you know, there must have been anxiety around atomic energy. There must have been, you know, about geopolitical concern, competition, you know, going into outer space. Maybe that was another impetus for this kind of communication beyond one's own culture. Um, but I think it's a great question. I'm, I'm old enough to remember. Right. Like it wouldn't do much good uh, five miles from home. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm really very interested in the idea of the contact between the whole world and the participation. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm sure. Except it.